the story of Christ before Pilate. Verse 24. When Pilate saw that he could reveal nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said his blood be on us and on our children. They released he for us unto them. Mid scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. When they had planted a crown of thorns, so they put it upon his head, and the reed in his right hand, they bowed the knee before him, mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spit upon him, took the reed and smote him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And God shall stamp with his own divine approval this reading from the infallible book for his name's sake. Amen. Gracious Father, we thank thee for thy blessed word, the word of the living God. We bless thee that it liveth and abideth forever. And we pray that tonight, as the word of God is preached, that there shall be indeed signs following the preaching of the word. O oh God, we pray that thou wouldst visit us with thy salvation and give us perfect liberty. May souls tonight close in with thy sin, kneel at the cross, be washed in the blood of the Lamb, and be saved for all eternity. Help, Lord, in the preaching of the word. And to this end I take the promised Holy Ghost, the blessed power of Pentecost, to fill me to the uttermost. I take. Thank God he undertakes. And the people of God say, Amen. Amen. I want to speak this evening upon a very solemn and upon a very heart-searching subject. I'm speaking upon the crown of thorns. Verse 29 of the 27th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. And when they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head. And when they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it 
upon his head. Just before we step over the threshold of Pilate's judgment hall, and we step into the common hall where the centurion band of soldiers are gathered, I would like you to remember the person who has been set at naught, crowned with arms, lashed with a scourge, stripped to his garments, and made a mock of by the soldiers. I'd like you to remember that this is none other than the Son of God. And God bless him. Oh, let us remember that the one who was put to shame on that dark night of man's deepest sin, in that dark night of man's most diabolical cruelty, was none other than God's dear Son. Then I want you to remember, secondly, the power of that person who was put to shame on that day. He was the one who made all things by the word of his power. He was the one who stretched out the heavens above us and the depths beneath us. He made the world out of nothing. By his word, all things were made, and without him was not anything made that was made, and by him do all things consist, or all together. That one had omnipotent power in his arm. He could have split the pavement of that judgment hall and damned every one of those men who attacked him, who scourged him, who spat upon him, and who mocked him. Never forget the power of the one that was crowned with thorns. And yet although he was God incarnate in the flesh, and although in the muscle of his human arm the rest of all the omnipotence and might of the Godhead. Yet for your sake, being reviled, he reviled not again, and being persecuted, he suffered it. Now there are some things about the crown of thorns that I want to draw your attention to. I want to talk about seven things that are related and are characteristic of the crown of war. I want to talk first of all of the material of the crown. It was a crown of war. They might very well if they had just want to talk the Savior and planted some straw and made it into a crown and placed it upon his brow. But no, it's not a crown of straw. It is a crown of horn. So we're going to talk upon the material of the crown. And then I want to talk secondly upon the making of the crown. Lay planted a crown of arms. And I want to consider with you for a moment or two the making of that chaplet of sorrow that was placed upon the blessed sensitive brow of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then I want to speak about the misery of the crown. The agony that that crown inflicted upon the body of Jesus Christ. But the greater agony 
the back home inspector upon the sanction of human soul of God incarnate in the flesh. We want to consider the misery of that God. Then I want you to look with me at the mockery of the crowd. And how those cruel soldiers mocked our Lord as they crowned him with horns. And I want you to understand just exactly what crowning Jesus with horns really meant. And what was the black diabolical purpose of those men as they crowned my finger with horn. We want to consider the mockery of the crown. And then, of course, that crown has a meaning, a deep meaning, a biblical meaning, a gospel meaning. And we want to discover the meaning of the crown. And you know, when we start looking into the Bible to find the meaning of that crown of thorns, we'll be led from meaning to mystery. And we'll be standing in the holiest of all. And we'll be considering something, my friend, about the mystery of the sufferings of Jesus Christ upon the cross. And then finally, I want by a way of application to bring what I believe is the message of that crown of thorns to you and to me this evening. So we're going to look then first at the material of the crown. It is a crown of thorns. I'd like to remind you that when God created this world, it was a thornless world, and it was a world without a fire. The seed of the thorn was not created by God at the creation. Thorns and thistles resulted from the fall. They were the direct result of man's sin and the curse of God resting upon creation because of man's sin. If you turn over with me to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17, you will find this is so. When God created this world, it was a world without a fire, without a thistle, and without a thorn. But when man fell, God said to him, Thorns also, verse 18 of Genesis 3, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herd of the field. Thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. You know, people come to me and they say to me, Mr. Gidley, why does God do this? Why does God do that? I want to tell you, friend, God doesn't do it. It's the result of man's sin that brings these sorrows and these heartaches and these headaches. There's some people would like to blame God for what's the result of their own sinning and of their own depravity. The thorns of this world are the result of sin. The tragedies of this world are the result of sin. The catastrophes and calamities that this old world is shaken with are the result of sin. Every war originates with sin. All death originates with sin. All sickness 
every minute to sin. Then there will be no sin. There will be no death. If there had been no sin, there would have been no sickness. If there had been no sin, there would have been no wars, bloodshed, or calamity. These things are the result of sin. You know, in Palestine, there are 25 kinds of thorns speaks to us of the universality of the curse. It's not very hard to find the thorn. You don't need to go far to find sin. It's in every hand. And this chapel that is pressed upon the brow of my lovely Savior in Pilate's judgment hall on that dark night was the insignia of all. Spoke of sin! And it reminds me that he who knew no sin was bad sin for me! And they crowned him with the insignia of the fall, for they knew them as it were the chief of sinners, in substitution for my sin. And for my guilt. The material of the crown. It was the crown of thorns. Secondly, we have the making of the crown. I want you to notice that it says they. This was not the work of an individual. This was the united work of the whole centurion band. They planted a crown of thorns. Every one of them is equally guilty. They all partook of this sin and of this crime. And my friend, there's not a man or woman in this meeting that's not guilty of the same sin of crowning Jesus Christ with thorns and refusing him as our own and personal Savior. Everyone here is guilty to you my sins, my cruel sins, his chief tormentors were. Each of my times became an ill and unbelief the spear. Ah, yes, my friend, were good. They plotted a crown of thorn. You could not possibly that a crown of thorns without drawn blood from your own fingers. It would be impossible to take without that long eastern thorn branch and plant it until it stayed together as a chance to be placed upon the Savior's brow as a crown to crown Christ in the mockery of cruel coronation. It would be impossible to do that without drawing blood from your own fingers. And therefore the blood of Jesus Christ touched those thorns. The blood of man already stained them. It was a blood-stained crown. Stained with man's Corrupt, sinful blood that was laid upon the head of Jesus. This is a most suggestive thing, friend. What does it mean? It means, my friend, that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is mingled with the blood of sinners. It means this, that Christ's blood, praise God, covers the blood of sinners. The blood is the life. Man's life was first of all upon that crown. It was on that crown in condemnation. But over man's blood there now flows the blood of Jesus. And the life of Jesus is stronger and more powerful than all the sin that flows in the veins of 
of sinners. And praise God, there's life in the Savior's blood, canceling out the death that's in me because of sin, taking away my guilt, pardoning my evil past, and making me fit to stand in God's presence forevermore. They put a crown of thorns. Is that what you've been doing? Plotting a crown of thorns for Jesus in time. Well, I'm going to tell you, you know what you're doing? You're making a bed of flowers for your soul to lie down for all eternity. The person that's plotting a crown of thorns and putting it on the head of Jesus in time is weaving a bed of flowers. A forest of thorns in which he'll dwell in agony for all eternity. The making of the crown. I want you to notice something here. I want you to notice the misery of the crown. Now see that rough, cruel, hard mouthed, hard hearted soldier. And he takes that crown in his hand. And he has placed Jesus upon an old chair, representative of a throne. And they put around his shoulders a royal robe, as it were. And then he goes up and he takes that crown of arms. And he puts it upon the blouse of Jesus. And all along the eastern thorns pierce down into Christ's temple. And that's not sufficient to satisfy the cruelty of the corrupt, depraved hearts of old men. So they take a reed in their hand and they beat that crown of thorns onto his head. I see that reed lifted. I see it fall upon the brow of Jesus. And those thorns are driven into the very hell. And from every thorn there flows a crimson river of the Savior's blood. He's looking at man through a veil of his own precious blood. The most sensitive part of the human body is the temple. And Jesus Christ him that day the agony of torture that no human lips could describe as they drove the thorns into his brow. Here we have human suffering unparalleled. Here we have human suffering indescribable. Here we have the depths of torture into which the human body can be plunged. Oh, the agony. Oh, the pangs. Oh, the misery of Jesus Christ crowned with arms. But that misery, friend, is something that we can at least understand and picture to you. But there's a misery that no human heart can understand. Jesus Christ was God. He was born to be king. As he sat in Pilate's judgment hall, he looked upon those men and he had made them. They were his creatures. He was the blessed creator. And in Pilate's Judgment Hall for the special, the creature, crowning the creator with thorn. They should have crowned him with diagrams of radiant beauty. They should have placed upon his brow the sparkling power of honor and of glory. But instead, they crowned him with arms. How did God feel that day? 
God the Son, as he saw his creatures who should have been crowning him with diadems of honor, instead crowning him with thorns. His heart was broken. His heart was overwhelmed within him. His heart was plunged into agonies unmentionable and unknowable to human mind or to human measurement. God's dear Son enduring the misery of the crown of thorns. Help me to understand it. Help me, dear Lord, to take it in. Oh, man, for thee, the Holy One, to bear away my sin, the misery of the crown. And then, of course, that crown was put upon him to mock him. That chair was in mockery of a throne. That robe was in mockery of a coronation robe. That flat crown was in mockery of a crown of diamonds or of rubies. What did they do it for that did it? To mock him. The bow the knee before him. And the rose up and they spat upon him. The spittles of men mingled with the blood of God and Christ running down its face. And there he is, crowned or born. Oh, that you could see him this evening. My lovely Lord, crowned with thorns. You know, they crowned him with thorns because they repudiated his claim. You see, Jesus claimed to be king. And they said, we'll show him what we think of his claims to kingly dignity and kingly power. We'll crown him not with diadems, but with thorns. We'll not put a chaplet of glory around his brow, but we'll put a chaplet of shame and dishonor upon his temple. And when they crowned him with thorns, they repudiated his claims to be king. Have you thus mocked my Savior too? Have you repudiated his claims to be king of your life? Thank God for every soul that can say of Jesus, King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy thorn crown brow. Lead me to Calvary. But I know there's men and women in this meeting and have crowned Christ with thorns by repudiating his claims. They've said no. I'll not let Jesus rule over me. I'll not have him as my Savior. And of course, this was not only a repudiation of his claims, but this was a ridiculing of his character. They were there to ridicule the Christ. What ridicule of Jesus is here seen in the stripping. Yes, they stripped him of his garments. He despised the shame. And then, having bared his back, they took his wrists and tied them together. And then they laid him over the scourging pole until his back lay bare to the scourge. And then they took up the lash, that lash that was in her platted lumps of lead, so that every time it fell, it just ripped the flesh and laid up a stream of blood. And I see that scourge come down upon the sensitive, tender, pure body of my Lord. No one could suffer like Jesus Christ. Our bodies are coarsened and hardened by sin, but his was a sinless 
body. No one could suffer like Jesus. And they laid open his back. And we have friends the stripping. And we have the scourging. And then we have the spitting. When they had him crowned with thorns, they went up and spat upon him. A hundred spittles, a hundred lips of a hundred soldiers making up the centurion band. And so either of evil men mingled with the blood of God incarnate on the face of Jesus, and not content to strip him, I'm not content to scourge him. I'm not content to spit upon him. They take their hands and pull the hairs from off his cheeks. And they plucked off his beard until his whole face was marred more than any man. And as far more than the sons of men. I want you to see him as they ridicule his character. My friend, you've done the same. You've ridiculed him, blessed Lord, by refusing his offer of mercy. He has stretched out his nail pierced hand to you, and you've pushed it aside. You've taken the brazen hand of the world, and the brazen hand of your sin, and the brazen hand of the lusts of the flesh, instead of the tender, sweet, nail printed hand of Jesus. Oh, you've ridiculed his character. How can you do it, sin? Ridiculing the character of my blessed Lord. And then rejected his compassion. You know, as they looked into the face of Jesus, and they had to look him in the face as they spat upon him, his eye was tender and was filled with love. There wasn't a flash in the eye of judgment. There wasn't a flash in the eye of resentment. There wasn't a flash in the eye of justice. It was all tender love. As they spat upon him, he was weeping for them. As they really killed him, he was praying for them. As they said of a God, his heart was overflowing with pardoning love and grace. Then they brought him to the cross and laid him down in the old tree. And I hear the hammer swung low. They are kneeling, my Lord, to the tree. The first prayer that he offered was not for his own suffering, was not for his own shame, was not for his own agony. But he was praying for those that crucified him. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. In Pilate's judgment hall, they mocked him, for they rejected his compassion. Are you a mocker of Jesus? O oh, mocker of Christ in this meeting, Praise God, my Savior loves you too. You've mocked him for years. You've chosen the world in its sin instead of God's path to heaven. You've taken the blessed breath that he has given, you, given to you, and instead of praising God with the breath he has given you, you've cursed him to his feet. O oh, mother of Jesus, let me tell you that he loves you still. Though you have sinned, there is mercy and pardon. Pardon for you and for me. And last of all, in that mocking, there was the refusing of his commandments. The repudiating of his claims. The ridiculing of his character. The rejecting of his compassion and the refusing of his commandments. They knew that he was a king. They knew his teaching. The prophet of Nazareth was well known in Palestine. His teachings were recorded from mouth to mouth and gossiped and talked about through the land. And they knew who he was. The miracles he did, 
to cleanse him in. And the commandments he got. Yet yonder in sight of judgment hall, they were refusing his commandments. Jesus says to you tonight, sinner, you must be born again. Are you refusing his commandments? Are you trampling under feet the Son of God and putting him to an open shame? What's the meaning of the crown? You know those thorns, they speak to me of three things. The Bible tells me of the good seed that fell among thorns. And afterward we read the thorns speak of the world. So those thorns speak of the world. And then over in the book of Numbers, I read that the nations that Israel refused to drive out at God's commandment, God said, I leave them to be with you, to be thorns in your side. And all during the history of Israel to the present day, these nations have been formed in the sight of Israel. We've had a five-day war in the Middle East, and the same nation, the Ishmaelites, have still been thorns in the sight of Israel, and they will be till Jesus comes. Those nations were described as thorns. They're a type of the flesh. The spirit lusted against the flesh, and the flesh against the spirit, and these two are contrary, the one to the other. And then, of course, those thorns speak to me of the devil. It was the devil that tempted Eve that seduced our first parents, that brought in the curse, and from the curse, what did there come? There came the thorns and the thistles that grows so abundantly in every land on the face of the earth. There's not a climate that doesn't produce thorns. There are thorns everywhere. It's a universal curse. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And Jesus Christ is crowned with thorns. What does it mean? In the old days in the arena, the victor always wore a crown. And as he wrestled in the arena, he wore the crown. When the victor was overthrown, the man who won the victory took the crown of his head. They put it in his own hand. And he walked out of the arena as a champion. And for years the world, the flesh and the devil were great champions. They were champions over mankind, people in hell with their temptations and machinations and strangulations. But blessed be God, Jesus Christ came. And he defeated the world. He defeated the flesh. And he defeated the devil. And praise God, they crowned him in mockery. But little did they know they were crowning him as a victor over the world, the flesh and the devil. That's the meaning of the cross. And of course, as we consider that meaning, we see its great mystery. You know, that crown of thorns is the fulfillment of one of the most precious prophecies in the word of God. If you turn over with me to Genesis chapter 22 in your Bible, in this chapter we have the last altar that Abraham ever built. If you want to read the life story of Abraham, you can mark the milestones in his pilgrimage with altars. But the last altar old Abraham ever built was in Mount Moriah. That's the Mount Calvary, the very same place where Jesus died. I believe in the very spot where Jesus was offered. One day, Abraham and Isaac climbed that hill, the Mount Moriah, 
That's where Calvary is. And you will remember that Abraham put Isaac upon an altar. And you will remember that God said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I, chapter 22, 11. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything upon him. For now I know that thy fear is God, seeing thou hast withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him, a ram caught in a thicket by his horn. That word thicket in the original Hebrew is a thicket of thorns. And here was a ram, and it was caught by the horn in a thicket. It was crowned with thorns. Abraham took that ram with the thorn still sticking in its brow. And he took Isaac off the altar. And he put the ram on the altar. And because the ram was there, Isaac lived. And the the ram died. Blessed, glorious type of substitution. I was upon the altar. The knife was lifted to slay me forever. But thank God there came one wearing a crown of thorns. And I was taken off the altar. And he took my place. He bore my punishment. He paid my debt. And praise God I live forevermore. Received into the home. Of the love of Abraham for all eternity. That, my friend, is a mystery of the crime. Do you know what Jesus from chapter 8? Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. He saw the crown of thorns and he was glad with the happiness of heaven. That crown of thorns, friend, is the chaplet of victory. Jesus Christ is the conqueror. But not only, friend, do we see the beauty of Calvary in the crown of thorns, but we have the beauty of the Savior in the crown of thorns as well. Do you know you couldn't produce on this earth a rose without a thorn? The rose and the thorn are all together. And I want to tell you, but for the thorns, (coughs) there would be no sweet rose of Sharon blooming for you and for me tonight. And thank God there is a sweet rose of Sharon. And pray God that's blooming for you and for me. And it's shedding its perfume of pardon and grace down upon the hearts of men. Thank God we have tasted and we have seen the beauty of the one who's the fair rose of Sharon. When I was in prison, Brother Riley and Brother Foster and myself, we used to sing a hymn, What though clouds shall overshadow and we seem to walk alone. And there's a verse in that hymn, and what a lovely verse it is. Give me Jesus, Jesus only. I possess a cluster rare. He's the fairest. Of ten thousand and rows of Sharon Fair. And because of the crown, there's a sweet rose that's blooming for you and for me. 
And that rose is Jesus Christ. Have you ever noticed the little head sparrow at the nesting time? And that little bird goes away in to a prickly hedge of thorns. And right in the center of that hedge of thorns, it builds its little nest. And those thorns are all around it. What are they there for? Why does it build its nest there? In order to be protected by the thorns. It goes through the thorns and in the center it builds its nest. And those thorns speak to me of the security that I have in Jesus Christ. <coughs> Praise God! I'm building my nest of Calvary! Thank God I'm surrounded with the thorns that the devil cannot penetrate. And like old Job, God's planted a hedge around me. And I'm safe in time. And praise God, I'm safe for all eternity. This is the mystery of the crown. And what's its message, friend? Its message is twofold. It's one of pardon, or it's one of perdition. This afternoon I stood at the graveside. A young man, just 46 years of age, member of my congregation, dear man of God, in perfect health this time last week, took a headache on Sunday afternoon, last Sunday afternoon, and on Monday afternoon he was returned. Sunk into unconsciousness. Never spoke, but passed on to eternity. And as I stood at that grave, surrounded by a great mass of men this afternoon, I said to those men, what if your body was in this casket? What if this was your grave? What if you had passed away on the afternoon? Where would you have been now? Where will you be in eternity? If you crown them with thorns tonight, you'll be in hell. If you crown them with thorns, friend, you'll be damned forevermore. Speaks of perdition. But praise God, it also speaks with pardon. And I can kiss the Son of God tonight. I can kneel at his feet. I can say, Lord Jesus, my sin, crown me with thorns. But I crown me now as my King and my Lord. Crown him with many crowns. The Lamb upon the throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. May God help you to crown him king tonight and saviour for Jesus' sake.